we've gone through this at 100 miles an hour. And as part of this panel, we had some, some initial questions that we, we get commonly when we talk about these apps. And so some of what we, um, we had were some of the costs are common questions that we get, some of the, the biggest challenges, lessons learned, um, how we get, how we know whether this app makes any kind of a difference, and what are some of the, the next steps. And so um, I'll start with some of the costs. One thing that we, we found with our, the two apps that I did, um, the calculator app was about $10,000 to do, and I think the new updates that we're adding will be another 2000 or so. And then the, the monitor, the record keeping one was about 6000 together. So um, that's kind of what you'd look at for an app that does things similar to that. So um, Carl, uh, did you have, I know you had done the hourly route. I don't know if you yeah. ever had a total or were comfortable sharing that. Yeah. But what well, you, we did go the hourly route, like uh, where I was a content manager and a coworker was kind of the overview of the app and then we had hourly paid uh, programmers uh, who were pretty good programmers but they were not knowledgeable and they didn't have enough uh, a lot of experience so I would say if you think you're going to avoid a lot of cost by avoiding hiring a professional or paying somebody who's qualified and has the experience you're going to pay that price through the time it takes to develop the app and the uh, the frustrations that <laughs> comes with using hourly labor. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, Rhonda, did you have any information on your development cost that you're willing yeah, to share? I figure mine cost about seven thousand for the initial run through. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty similar to the record keeping one I had done. Um, I know you mentioned it already, Heather, but you had said for everything together was about a hundred thousand. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, that was um, a very, I would say, <laughs> very completed version of a web application and a, and a mobile application mm -hmm. that talk, you know, they talk to each other, send data back and forth, and they do a lot of um, calculations as well. So, yeah, I would say it's a pretty complex Yeah, um, I, agree. I think one app. of the values in an app like this is to be able to integrate all that data later on, and that's something I would I would consider more strongly if I was redoing this. But, um, Jeff, you kind of had a range that you see is common. If people are just even thinking about it, what sort of a ballpark range should they be thinking in terms of an app? Sure. Yeah, so um, typically apps run with us anywhere, anywhere from around $5,000 up to $20,000. It's kind of the range that most of them fit in. Thank you. Um, as far as biggest challenges, for me, I think one of the biggest challenges was just in being early in the process. Um, you know, Jeff talked about that process we went through, and I think he learned the hard way by working with me why we need to talk about some of these things up front um, but just not being real sure of, for example, um, even things like, you know, we expect this app to be used outdoors. And it was so wonderful to have an experienced developer like Jeff because he could tell me, well, I know you meant like those colors, but these colors are known to show up better on a screen in, in that sort of situation. And so little things like that, it was... Um, really nice to have the benefit of, of somebody like of like Jeff, but just being early in this process and not always knowing the right questions to ask was a big challenge. Um, Carl, how about you? What did you find as a challenge? The biggest challenges that uh, we faced dealt with, first of all, just communications between the content expert knowing what he wanted and being comfortable with the units and everything else. but having challenges explaining that to those who are less knowledgeable of the content but were pretty good in the programming. Uh, the other uh, challenge we had was just dealt with error checking um, from a mathematical perspective but also units and just beta testing uh, related. Mm -hmm. And those are necessary things to do. <laughs> I mean, 
it's not something you can get away without, is it, Carl? Uh, actually, I'm going to put a request in. We've got, I think, 39 folks who are signed in. Uh, you guys have been drafted as beta testers and reviewers, so if you find holes and faults in the apps that I developed, I'd sure appreciate comments. The more eyes, the better. Yes, always. Rhonda, what were some of your challenges? Um, I used a student who was... I, you know, he's a student when I started with him, and now he's doing some of that web development. But the timeline was just a huge issue. Things weren't done when they were supposed to be. Some of it drug out a long time. And then the beta testing, that's the ability to test the app, you know, before it's released was another big issue for me. There wasn't a program or a, a system they were using to do that, or you didn't have the ability to get in and beta test it? He had it so he could do it on on his computer, but I didn't have access to that. So I could meet with him and play with it for a little bit, but that was very, very limited. And you really need to be able to play with it for a lot more than that. Yeah, I would agree. I know, Heather, you said that you could talk for five hours on some of the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the challenges you, you faced? Well, and I, I think similar to what you said, Jill, it was just sort of being in that space so early. Um, and just the fact, just like I said, I'm an agronomist. I'm not a developer at all. Um, and, you know, just that communication um, and the language that we use and the language the developers use and just not, you know, it was really difficult to be on the same page. The other thing um, I think was a challenge is, is really being, um, is the storyboarding part. You know, the discovery part of building these apps is, um, because we, we really didn't quite know where it was going to go, it was really hard to, you know, put costs on it and prices and stopping points. And um, and so, you know, just really knowing what you want and being able to lay that out um, in a very, you know, detailed storyboard is, is pretty important to, to getting where you need to go for the least cost in a timely fashion. <laughs> so that would be my words of advice. Awesome. Jeff, what do you see as some of the common challenges you run up against or the common uh, areas that people run into problems? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's, it's along the same line as um, what everybody else is saying, maybe just on, on kind of the other side of the, of the fence with it. Um, you know, just trying to, to understand, um, you know, in, in these cases where it's a real niche type app that's, that's for a very specific type of, of user group and, and, and making sure that um, while, while all of the content in it is so foreign to, to myself, um, you know, making sure I'm doing it the right justice and, and describing things in the right way in the app. And, and so um, it, that's always a challenge, and I don't know if there's, there's any way to, to make that not a challenge when you're, you know, you just don't have that, that background knowledge of it. But um, I think certainly the more we've worked on, for example, app type pro or ag type projects, the more um, all of that language is becoming more and more familiar and easier to work on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, communication is, is definitely something you want to do often. Um, I know Jeff and I would meet, like we, we were about two and a half hours apart and we would meet halfway um, face to face every now and then because it was you could just communicate a lot more face to face than you can over a, a phone or through email. And so communication is pretty critical. Um, as far as lessons learned or advice, for me I think the most agonizing decision whether or not it should have been was whether or not to charge for the app. And because it was funded through a grant and it was new and and I was aware that there would have to be some future updates. Um, I wanted to know if can you create a little pool of funds that might help make the app self-sustaining? Does that make it more desirable to funders to work with you if you don't have to keep coming back to them over and over? And the data we had at that time, and, and again, this is where a good developer helps because Jeff had a lot of great information on um, price points and what people felt about different price points, did they see differences in downloads. And so we set a rather low price point at the time. 
um, 99 cents, like I said. Um, what I've learned since then and, and the fact that in-app pur purchases have come about since then, I would say you probably either need to make the app free and then if you feel like the more complex parts of the app, like maybe being able to tie into a web application like what Heather has, you can look at charging for that as an in-app purchase. Um, or else you need to make the app fairly high price to start with if it, if it has enough value. And, and so I would, that's my thought, is either make it free or go big as far as, as the price goes on an app. And, and I learned the lesson very resoundingly that at a low price point like what we had, you're not even going to come close to creating a pool of funds to sustain an app. So, um, and then also to use that pilot test group, I had about a dozen folks that were content experts on different parts of manure and nutrient management testing the app for me, and they were amazing. And I think most of the folks that talked today were part of that group, and some of you in the audience probably were as well. So um, that's definitely something that you, you would want to do as far as I was concerned. That group was really valuable. So, um, Carl, what were some of your, your lessons? For um, I think part of the biggest lesson that uh, we found was as part of the communication was just co conveying the idea that I as a content person trying to pretend I was a user in terms of what I wanted to, the questions to be and how I wanted to work through the process of supplying inputs to get the answer I want and the format I wanted. Uh, I finally settled on using an existing spreadsheet that I'd been playing with from a calculational perspective and added drop-down menus and things like that and scaled it so that I was able to mock it up and pass the spreadsheet to the people doing the coding and say, hey, I want something that looks like this. And that really led into the next lesson is by doing the mock-up that way, I was able to have the mock-up be able to do the calculations so after they did the coding, they'd have a way to double-check the math checking themselves as they worked the formulas up and that kind of thing. So, you know, to me, that was the two biggest things is follow up the communications, you mock it up and think about what you want and what you want it to look like and use that to communicate it to the between the planner and the content people. Yes, that's excellent. Um, Rhonda, what did you have for advice or lessons learned? Lessons learned definitely try you need to question what kind of ability you'll have to beta test it. That that's been a big issue for me. And then also just how to access the information on the number of downloads. Um, that's also an issue for me. Yeah, I can see that. Um, Heather, what do you have for, for advice? You know, I, uh, similar again to what Phil said, we struggled with the, the price. Um, you know, in terms of beta testers, we already had this course going, so we had tons of beta, not tons, but plenty of beta testers and the, with the farmers that we were teaching this course to, everybody that was taking the course was using GoCrop and every version of it and making comments as they used it to make improvements. So so that was a great way to um, beta test the versions that we were going through with GoCrop and that we had farmers in, in sort of a classroom setting that were using it hands-on. And even today, I just finished teaching nutrient management class, you know, 60 new farmers that are using GoCrop. And we have a whole platform set up, so if there's a bug or something we want to um, fix, we just hit a button and we can type that in and it gets sent to the developer. Um, so having the people that are going to use your tool, you know, beta testing it is, is awesome. We were really fortunate to be able to, to do that. Um, and then other, uh, the pricing thing, that was a, a lesson, too, and I agree with Jill on that. Um, that's what we do. We, we buy the web app and you get the iPhone app for free, which, um, and we're still struggling with, price, you know, what price to charge um, so that we do make enough money to maintain, you know, the web app. And then other lessons learned. Um, one of the important lessons, I think, especially for a tool like ours, is to make sure you think about the future even though you can only think about the moment <laughs> because, you know, now that GoCrop is what it is, um, we look back and say, oh, if we just would have 
thought a little bit bigger about it, we would have set the database up differently. Um, and now we actually need to go back and redo um, some of that to scale out. So, you know, it's sometimes better to think bigger initially and scale back. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Jeff, I know most of your presentation was about some of the advice you have and lessons learned, but do you have any one major point you'd really like to emphasize or, or bring about here? No, I, well, probably the only one would be um, the localization. Um, I think that's, this is definitely one of those projects that led us to really make sure we're asking those questions early on in, in, in all other apps. Um, just because, as, as Jill mentioned, we're, we're making this um, uh, metric capable as well. And so had we known that right off the bat, there certainly were some things we could have done to make that easier uh, and maybe even make it to where it's almost like a, a flip of a switch type thing. But um, now, you know, looking through the project, it's, 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 a, it's a larger project than it needs to be. And so um, that's, a, that's probably my biggest takeaway. But honestly, a lot of those, those um, items I listed on that scope, I could directly go back and, and talk about, you know, some specific things with this project just because this was so early on in our app development, I would say. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, the other one is hiring a hiring a good developer. <laughs> that was my my solution to most everything. <laughs> so, and then um, impact and usage. Um, I'm going to say that's been a challenge because it, I, I think a lot of the different things that you can build into an app to track, you know, in the background weren't available, and so for me. It involves actually having a relationship with people that are using the app is the only way I can track some of the impact. If somebody's using it and they maybe have a suggestion or they give me some feedback on how they're using it or how they could use it better, it's about the only way I get feedback. And, and that's made it really hard to justify this to, um, I mean, it was early enough that even doing it seemed like a cool thing in your annual reporting, but now when you look at what has impact has this had and other people are saying, is this worth my time to do? I don't have great data to give them, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, but having that connection to your users can get some of that information if you don't build it into the app, which I suggest you do if you can. Um, how about any of the others? Do you have any advice in that regard? as far as tracking impact or more than just downloads? So, Heather, with your farmer group, you, is that the main way that you get some of your information on how it's being used? Is you're actually in the room with them or in contact with the users, or do you have some background um, stats that you get. In terms of tracking impact, again, we, you know, it's pretty easy for us to track downloads because you have to actually, when you purchase the web app or purchase a free trial, we're asking people to type in a, you know, a bunch of information where they're from and, and all those things. In terms of, um, you know, level of satisfaction, we have not really tracked that with the exception of the people that we work with in Vermont. So I wouldn't say we're doing that great of a job. Or we're doing a good job, but we're also looking at a very small audience at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having a specific audience is, is good. Or at least having a relationship with them, I think, can get some of that information yeah. as well. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to ask each of the presenters to talk a little bit about their future plans on their app, and then we'll address any of the questions that you bring in. And of course, I know that if you get the handout or the app information, um, anybody is going to be glad to answer answer these questions. So um, for me, I think I covered some of the updates and what we plan to do pretty well with the, making the app free in the next couple of months and adding the nitrogen availability piece to it. Um, Carl, do you have any future plans or, or updates that you have online? Oh, uh, I just 
the immediate plan is to go back and uh, double check the functionality of the apps and things like that. Is second, I guess. Uh, beta testing may be one word to call it, but when uh, Jeff uh, mentioned that you need to go back and touch the code to make sure the code still works the way it needs to, that caught my attention, so I need to go back and verify that. Uh, but I do have a plan to further investigate apps, potentially involving nutrient management planning uh, online for I'm looking, done. At, looking at having a place to integrate a lot of the, the data. Yeah. Well, at one time, it's been several years ago, we were looked at the idea of uh, taking all of our nutrient management planning to online with the state database with different levels of uh, user access so that you'd have the privacy security issues that you were interested in. And it was, it was interesting, but it was a pretty big project, and we just kind of dropped it. Uh, now may be the time to go back and kind of re revisit that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Rhonda, what are some of your future plans? In our, and I, you mentioned having a spreadsheet that you're sort of connecting the data to. Um, what are some of your, I know you have another app as well. So, what do you right. Think? We're working on a critical records of production app, a crop app, and that would be to help um, record what crops are planted in which fields, um, when you've applied pesticides, when you've applied fertilizer, um, just again, the little spiral notebook, for, but for some of the crop aspects to coordinate with the manure management. And then you mentioned a spreadsheet that people can bring the information into that actually does some of the nutrient calculations for them? Right. Um, yeah, because we actually looked at trying to see if we could make things, you know, have it so that we'd have a big spreadsheet that people could fill all their information in and, you know, basically have that in the cloud. And we decided that was way too complex and I didn't begin to have the budget for that. So we have a simple spreadsheet. They may want their own spreadsheet, you know, but it's a a good starting point. It lets them do a lot of the nutrient balancing. Awesome. Thank you. And um, I know you mentioned a little bit of some of your future plans, Heather. Do you have um, other ones to mention? Yeah. I mean, I you know our big thing right now is um, putting a mapping um, a mapping component into both the web and the mobile apps. Um, and then that's a big piece. Doing a lot of enhancements on the on the app, both apps at this point, um, sort of fine tuning things a bit. Having um, um, sort of being able to print reports that farmers can um, uh, customize, you know, for specific information they're looking for. And then um, we are working on uh, Go Graze, um, sort of a sister brother app to Go Crop that's more specific to grazing operations and grazing planning. Okay. And hopefully we answered your question some, Doug. Um, Doug mentioned, besides Heather, are any of the developers planning on being able to connect the data collection to be able to input or sync to a manure management plan? And I think, to be quite honest, one of the if I was looking to use those apps that we've already developed to go into a, a more robust system, my, my first thought would be to actually talk with somebody like Heather who's already done that and see if there's a way we can just piggyback or, or work together on that rather than building another one. You know, I don't know if it would end up being possible, but I certainly think that would be where I would look, um, try to build on something that's already out there. Um, and I would I would say that um, from my perspective we're very 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 open to that. This is a you know a public publicly developed tool that we would like to see you know the framework and um, is there <laughs> the base is there and it was very expensive to build. Everybody just said that they you know in one way or the other would like to go that direction, but the expense of it um, is significant and we already spent the money. So <laughs> why not? you know, tap into what's already there, and I think it's, um, you know, it's there. You know, it already has the P-index built into it, needs to be modified by state, has um, manure calculator, you know, so much of the things that people are talking about, um, yield monitors and um, 
pest management tools, and now, you know, it'll have some free um, complex grazing planning tools, too, so. Excellent. And then I'm, I've already gone a few minutes over, but I'm going to just ask um, Jeff to share a closing comment on where you think um, apps are going and what's the best you know, uses for apps. I know the idea of an app is just kind of being a miniature version of somebody's website seems to really be falling by the wayside, but as far as what, if you can look into your crystal ball, what would you tell this group to be looking towards as far as the future and, and how to make these really useful? Boy, nothing like ending with a tough question there. Sorry. Um, you I would it. say, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, um, you know, apps are, are just getting more and more niche. Um, you know, I think, the, but like you mentioned, they're not, the trend in apps is not to have them do everything. You know, just have them do a very specific task and have that task be done very well. Um, if you need stuff that's larger than that, then, lar then likely you're, you're looking at more of a web app uh, and, and, and something like that. And then we're also seeing a lot more convergence between um, what can happen between web apps and mobile apps and, you know, can you make these web apps more mobile friendly? Um, so I, there's going to be a lot more of that happening in the next couple of years. 